Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. So thank you, um, and I thank you for you know inviting me here today. I'm really um, delighted to be able to come down and talk to you about some of the work that we're doing. It's really an honor to to be able to talk to you guys. So, uh, all right. So uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is these these metals with memory. Um, so you can see this butterfly on the screen, and I actually brought in the. Um, butterfly, <laughs> so that you guys can come up after the lecture and look at it. There are no moving parts to this butterfly. There's no piston. There's nothing that's actually causing the wings to move. The only thing that there is is a piece of wire, just like that over there, that's under here. It's right under the wings. And so what's happening is that it's, as the wire is heating up and cooling down, the actual material is expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. And that's what's causing the wings to move. So this material, which is called nickel titanium, so it's an equal, pretty equal mix of nickel atoms and titanium atoms, can do this. And this is a very, very unique property. Um, it's called shape memory. So it's actually being deformed and then going back to its original shape, forming and going back to its original shape. And we say that the material is the machine. Um, that's, that's kind of the, <laughs> uh, what we say about nickel titanium. We can, we can do things like this. Um, and make things move without actually having a bunch of moving parts. So you can imagine that this is very, very useful um, when you bring things down to a very small scale, like in MEMS and things like that. Um, so I do encourage you to come up and, and actually take a look very closely at the butterfly after the lecture. So uh, before we begin talking about this, uh, this material, this nickel titanium, um, I want to start by talking about just the field of solid mechanics in general. Um, because I'm not in physics, I'm in solid mechanics, um, but they're very closely related. Um, in solid mechanics, what we care about are forces and deformations. We care about the interaction between how you push or pull or twist something and how the material deforms in response to that. Um, and, and this is prevalent in both the natural world and the engineering world at all length scales. Forces and deformations always matter. And so as mechanicers, what we care about is trying to understand if I push something this way or if I pull something this way, how is the material going to respond? And, and this, this is important all length scales. So I, I went and just picked up a bunch of different examples. Um, if you look at the natural world, there are mechanicers who work on um, earthquake faults um, that are several hundreds of miles long. If you look at a, a whale right, coming out of the ocean and, and slapping back down and, and how the forces are, are affecting the deformation of the whale, um, there are plenty of mechanicers who work on uh, biomedical issues like your bone um, and your muscle and uh, how, how your, you know, your bone remodels when it uh, undergoes a certain amount of force and how it deforms in response to that force. Um, and, and you keep going down the length scales. And so we're going from you know, huge length scales down to tiny length scales. Um, you look at red blood cells and as they're being pumped through a vessel, how they're deforming and trying to get through that vessel. Um, the T4 bacteriophage, that's a very small little, it's a couple, maybe 100 nanometers long. Um, and there's, there's um, and, uh, salt me mechanicians who work on figuring out how that bacteriophage lands and how it deforms while it's um, interacting with your cells, um, all the way down to atoms. Um, we have people in the mechanical engineering department who are working on um, things like uh, density functional theory, which is a way that atoms interact with each other and the forces that different atoms exert on each other and how that affects the behaviors of materials. Um, so that's the natural world. You then look at engineering, and so we have to uh, build things. Um, and when engineers build bridges, we care a lot about how the um, impact of the air and the wind and how the impact of the water and the impact of the cars driving over it, all those forces, how they affect the deflection of the bridge. 
Um, for those of you who have seen the Tacoma Narrows, which is a, a very, <laughs> right, it's a very good example of what happens when you don't take that into consideration, how these forces are gonna affect the behavior of the bridge. If you haven't seen the Tacoma Narrows, um, it's, it's a bridge that basically they didn't account for um, the oscillation of, of wind and, and wind introducing a, a natural frequency in the bridge. And so it started swaying like this and basically shatters. It's spectacular. Um, <laughs> um, um, uh, you know, and then you go down a length scale and you have um, uh, planes. We work a lot on, on trying to figure out, you know, you look at a plane and, and that's a, in some ways, an incredibly complex um, uh, thing from a mechanical standpoint. Every time you go up in the air, you pressurize, right? Because the inside of the plane is going to remain at a certain pressure and the outside of the air doesn't have as much pressure. So every time you take off to 30,000 feet, now you're pressurized. And when you come back down, you depressurize, right? And you're doing that many, many, many cycles. Um, you, you also worry about things like stents. Um, so now we're going down length scales. Um, if you put a stent inside somebody's body, it's going to also undergo a similar cyclic loading as the heart's pumping blood, right? And then as you're twisting, right, it's going to be undergoing some very complex deformations inside your body because you move, right? Same thing with things like bone implants and um, orthopedic implants. And we keep going down. What happens when you get down to, so you look at this stent and it's made up of, let's say, aluminum, okay, or steel. You go down to a very small length scale, so now we're at about, maybe this is 100 microns across, and it turns out that metals are made up of these things called grains. And in each grain, the atoms are arranged in a different way. So perhaps in this, let's say that the atoms are arranged in a cube. Perhaps in this grain, the cube's like this. Okay, standing straight up. And now if we look at this grain here, the cube's like this. Okay, so the atoms are still cubic. It's just in one grain, they're like this and in the next grain, they're like this. And this black line right here, uh, here we go. This black line right here is the interface between those cubes. Okay, so we have to worry, this is called microstructure, and we have to worry a lot about that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this today. And keep going down like scales. This is a carbon nanotube. Um, so we have people in the mechanical engineering department who work on these. And this is basically a, a very, um, ordered arrangement of carbon in a tube. It has very unique electrical properties, um, very unique properties that are, are useful for anything ranging from um, electronics to armor. Um, and then here, I wanted to show this to you, we also work on the mechanics of things like, ah, here we go. Um, uh, this is an atomic force microscope image. So what we do is we take a little, um, basically cantilever beam, and we basically run it over the surface of, an, of a, material, and we can bring out the atoms. So what you're looking at here, this is um, graphite, and these are the hexagonal graphite cells, and at each intersection is actually an atom. So we can image atoms, right? And we can look at how the behavior of this graphite depends on how these atoms are moving with respect to each other. So, so the big thing here and the take home message is that forces and deformations, no matter if you're looking at the natural world, or the engineering world, no matter what length scale you're working at, this is a fundamental thing that's incredibly important to anything ranging from you know, a virus to an airplane. <laughs> so um, a lot of the fundamental questions in material science and in mechanical engineering, they deal with the interactions between the length scales. Um, so, so you care about how things at the atomistic scale and how things at this microstructure scale with all these grains, how that affects the behavior of the stent that's put into your body or how that affects the behavior of the plane that you're riding in. And uh, you want to understand these processes. Um, you want the plane to be safe. You want the stent to last longer. You want the body armor that you're making to have a better impact resistance. And so you wonder about how you can arrange the atoms to make that happen. Um, and so we care about doing things on the small length scale to make better properties at the large length scale or the macroscopic length scale. So today I'm going to talk about one specific material, uh, nickel titanium, but we're going to keep this idea throughout the lecture of linking length scales. Um, so this nickel titanium, this equal mix of nickel and titanium, is a shape memory alloy. Um, and what shape memory alloys are, are they metallic materials that can remember a previously defined um, shape or form 
when they're deformed and then heated. So I have a video and then I was also gonna show you a, a real life demo. Um, let's do the real life demo first. Uh, yes. Okay, great. So this is my wire and it's been shape set basically into a straight wire. Um, but you can do this into any sort of, you can make it say your name, you can make it say Michigan, you can make it say whatever you want. Okay. Um, and so what I'm gonna do, it's a little hard to see but this is relatively straight. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna deform it. Okay, so pretty deformed, right? That's a lot of, a lot of uh, deformation on this. If this was stainless steel or if this was um, aluminum, you'd be pretty much done, okay, if you put a lot of permanent deformation in it. But this isn't, this is shea memory alloy. So what happens is I'm gonna put this loop, hopefully you guys can see it up there, okay, so it's all deformed. I'm gonna put this loop into the hot water, okay, so now I'm, he I'm heating it, and what you're gonna see happen, whoop, <laughs> all right. So it really wants to be back in its original shape. <laughs> um, so that doesn't happen with a normal material. <laughs> um, so I will go past that since the demo worked. Um, so that's the, <laughs> um, that's the first, uh, that's the first uh, property, is shape memory. The cool thing is, this material has actually two unique, incredible properties. The first one is that, which I, I love. Um, the second one is super elasticity, which is also incredibly cool. So this is super elasticity, and super elasticity is exactly what it sounds like. It's super elastic. So just like a rubber band is elastic, right? It's the same idea, except this is a metal, okay? So I'm gonna play this, and I'm gonna show you these stents that are being twisted and bent and, and um, deformed, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna pop back to their original shape. If this was a normal stent, a normal material, like stainless steel, you couldn't do that. You would squish the stent and it would stay squished. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so these stents, you're pushing them, they're coming back up. And then, okay. So that's a lot of deformation and it's just springing right back. Okay, this is a metal. Okay, so usually metals don't, don't do this. And if you look actually at the end, you can twist this stent and it pops back. Okay. So this is incredibly useful when you want to get big things like stents into small spaces like veins. Um, you know, usually when you want to put a stent in, you've got to basically cut somebody open to give yourself enough room to go in and get the stent in. It's very, very intrusive. Um, recently, I'm going to show you an example um, of the, what's called the Amplatzer Septal Defect Occlusion Device. Um, Amplatzer is the, the brand, and septal defect occlusion device just means a heart patch. So what basically happens is that somebody has a hole in their heart, and what we're gonna do, um, and this is in practice now, um, is, is use a nickel titanium heart patch to patch the hole. And the reason we do this is because instead of having to cut somebody open, and go in with the heart patch and do this pretty intricate procedure, um, you know, really open them up. Because it's super elastic and because you can squish it down on a really small area, you can actually take the heart patch, this is basically a sheath, this blue thing is a sheath that's over the heart patch and the heart patch has basically been collapsed down and is on this um, catheter. So what they've done instead, it's a percutaneous procedure, which means it's put in through a stick in the, uh, needle stick in the groin. So you find a large vein, and you just, instead of slicing someone open and really opening them up, you just feed it in through a needle stick in the groin. Um, and so what you do is you locate the defect. So this here is our defect. And I wanna make, this is actually um, uh, courtesy of Dr. Robert Frankel from the Cardiac Catheterization Lab um, at Mayo Menides Medical Center. Um, you stick it in, here's the defect, you pass it through. And then what, what you're basically doing is you're pulling the sheath off of this nickel titanium mesh. So it's expanding as you pull the sheath off. But because it was super elastic, you could crunch it down on the catheter, feed it up through the vein, and now you pull off the sheath and it springs back to its original shape inside the body. Okay. So we open up the left side of the disc first and we pull it up against the septum okay, where, the, where the defect is. And now what we do is once that's um, securely up against the wall on the left side, we open up the right side of the disc, and the right side gets securely positioned 
against the hole. Okay? And then what we do is we undo our guide wire and we pull it out. And instead of a, a major procedure, this is still a major procedure. You're putting a heart patch into somebody's, and this is, this is, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> um, but, but instead, it's, you know, the patient's in the hospital for one day. Um, a friend of mine in graduate school actually had this done with this exact heart patch. Um, you're, you're in the hospital for one day, um, and then you're back to a normal routine a few days after that. So it's, it's less morbidity, less time in the hospital, um, less impact on the patient's health. Um, and the reason this works is because the two discs are made out of this, this what's called nitinol or this nickel titanium. Nitinol is just the trade name for this nickel titanium material. Um, and so the two discs are made out of this wire mesh which allows super elasticity. Um, now nitinol or nickel titanium, it's not a naturally occurring metal. So then the question becomes, okay, how did we find out about this? Um, and, and like many things in, in history, it was actually um, determined by chance. And so it turns out that a lot of the fundamental discoveries throughout history have been lucky accidents. And so I actually picked a couple major examples, okay, um, just because I think it's neat. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, all of these things, these were all basically determined by chance. Um, the smallpox vaccination, uh, Edward Jenner was this British scientist and surgeon, and the story goes that Jenner basically was talking to a milkmaid, and the milkmaid said, hey, you know, it's weird. Everybody at my dairy farm, anybody who got cowpox, which is not deadly, carried by cows, hasn't died. <laughs> and, and, you know, anybody who didn't, and when they get smallpox, they die. And so Jenner thought, huh, that's really interesting. So he took actually pus from the sores of a smallpox victim, uh, sorry, pus from the sores of a cowpox victim who was still alive, and inoculated a subject with them. This was in the days where medical subjects were not as well regulated. <laughs> waited a couple, you know, waited a couple of months, and then he inoculated the same, the same subject with smallpox um, to see if he would die. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and the story goes that the subject was actually an eight-year-old boy, <laughs> um, which makes it even worse, but, um, but the, the subject didn't die. Um, and so that was, from that experiment came the idea of vaccination. And the idea that, you know, subjecting someone to a weaker strain of something protects them from a lethal strain. Um, something like uh, x-rays. So x-rays was actually a German physicist, his name was Röntgen, um, and he was studying cathode rays. And what cathode rays are is basically the phosphorescent stream of electrons that are used in everything from TV sets to fluorescent light bulbs. Um, so it's basically a stream of electrons. And they already knew that cathode rays could penetrate thin pieces of metal, and they knew that if you put a phosphorescent screen, a fluorescent screen placed away really close to the, the beam, that basically you could, it would glow. Okay. Um, and he was just playing around in his lab, and he had a glass tube, um, and he basically wrapped it in black cardboard, and he was trying to see if um, the rays could escape. And he had a, a phosphorescent screen, a fluorescent screen, placed on the wall a couple meters away from his tube. And what happened was he was running this experiment and then he saw, it was in a dark lab, and he saw the screen light up a couple meters away. And it turns out that he had actually changed the cathode ray. As it escaped from the tube, it changed its nature and it became an X-ray. Um, totally, you know, by chance. Um, and so this new ray could penetrate solids um, and it could even record the image of a human skeleton on um, a photographic film. Um, and so in 1901, the first year that the Nobel Prize um, the first year of the Nobel Prize, he actually won the Nobel Prize for this discovery of what he called the X-ray. Um, other examples are Alexander Fleming. Um, he basically was, was looking at a bacteria that causes um, food poisoning, and he noticed that there was this random mold in his Petri dish, and that the, the dangerous um, food poisoning bacteria didn't grow near the mold. And so, you know, you might, if you weren't paying attention, you might just kind of throw it away and say, oh, this isn't working, right? And he said, hey, wait a second, you know, this, this mold is inhibiting the growth of this bacteria. Let's take a look at it a little closer. And it turns out that penicillin is this, you know, major drug for killing bad bacteria in our system without harming us. Um, and then the last example is actually um, uh, two German physicists, uh, Mehring and Minowski, Minkowski, um, who were looking at um, pancre pancreases and what they did is they removed the pancreas from a healthy dog because they just wanted to look at the role of pancreas in digestion. And what they found was a couple days later, they saw all these flies near the dog's um, urine. 
And so they looked at that a little more closely and they realized the dog was excreting sugar in its urine. And it was the first time that anyone had made the link between the pancreas and the regulation of sugar. That led to the development of insulin. So, so these are major examples. Um, and obviously, nickel titanium is a smaller example. <laughs> um, but what I want to illustrate here is that it's, these are examples of being in the right place at the right time, um, but also being prepared and curious enough to go explore things that are weird. So to not just have something weird happen and think, oh, that's weird, and, and move on, but to actually be prepared enough and curious enough to go and explore that further. Um, so in the case of nickel titanium, um, basically what happened was this guy, Bueller, um, he was hired to develop metallic materials originally for the uh, nose cone of the US uh, Navy Polaris reentry vehicle. And um, he was looking at a bunch of different alloys. And he kind of settled on a mix of nickel and titanium. He was actually making different mixtures um, because it had a high impact resistance and it was ductile. And all ductile means is that it was, in some senses, stretchable. It, you could deform it a lot before it broke. And, um, and so he's focusing on that. And one day, um, he was messing around with cold bars and he was messing around with hot bars because he had to deal with temperature changes. And what he noticed is, I'm going to play this movie, that the sound of the bar would change as the bar warmed up. So if you listen, you're going to hear it's going to start out very cold and it's going to sound like a thud when he drops it. And then he's going to drop it two more times as the bar is heating up and it's going to sound more and more like a ring. It's the same bar. Thud. Okay, so as it's warming up, um, there's no change in composition and there's no change in processing. The only thing that changed in this bar was the temperature. So the only thing that could really be changing this acoustic sound is the atomic structure. So it's the way that the atoms are arranged. And you can think about this. If you want to change the sound of your voice, what do you do? You change the dimensions of your voice box. It's the exact same thing for a material. If you want to change if you want to influence acoustic damping, you, you change the structure of the atoms. So this was an indication that the atoms were actually moving around as it heated up. Um, and because the atoms are arranged differently, there's actually two, which I'm going to talk about next, two different solid phases of nickel titanium. In one, the atoms are arranged in a cube. And in the other ones, the atoms are arranged in kind of a skewed tetragon. Okay? And depending on which phase it's in, if it's a cube, or if it's a tetragon, it sounds different, just like your voice box, if it changes shape, would make your voice sound different. So, so structure matters. And um, so let's talk a little bit more about why atomic structure matters so much. So what's the difference, or what, what do diamond and pencil lead have in common, right? Okay. Um, very, very different materials, right? They're the same stuff. They're both carbon, right? They're just in a different structure. So graphite or pencil lead, okay, and diamond. And so you can see these structures. And basically, graphite is a sheet-like structure. So all the atoms in graphite, they lie in a plane. And they're only weakly bonded to the sheets. You'll have a strongly bonded sheet, a strongly bonded sheet, and then a weak bond in between. Okay? Carbon is more like, uh, sorry, diamond is more, it's a framework structure where the carbon atoms are very strongly bonded to each other. In a, in a truss structure. And so, um, so these are very different compositions and obviously have totally different properties. Graphite is opaque, diamond is transparent. Graphite's a great lubricant, diamond is the ultimate abrasive. <laughs> um, graphite's a good conductor of electricity and diamond's an excellent electrical insulator. Graphite's very soft, Diamond's the hardest known natural substance. These two things could not be, you can buy a pencil for 20 cents. You can buy, <laughs> uh, so these two things could not be, um, you know, any more different. So, so it's a similar thing um, with nickel titanium. The structure matters. So we know that the different sounds of those two bars were caused by an atomic structural change, a, way, a difference in the way that the atoms were, were arranged. And so, um, so as we're playing this, the thud is actually when the atoms are arranged in that, tet that kind of that skewed tetragon. And the ring is when the atoms are arranged in, in kind of a cube. Okay. So, uh, so this is what they look like. Okay. So the, the thud 
they both actually look a little bit like cubes. It's hard to see, it's a very sh uh, gentle shift. But the thud is basically what we call martensite. Okay, that's the one that was the cold bar. And it looks like a skewed tetragon. It's a tetragon that the angles are a bit weird. Um, the martensite, or the austenite, is the ring. And that is when the atoms are arranged in a cube. So I'm going to use these words a lot during this lecture. Um, so it's two different solid state phases. The austenite is a cube. The martensite is, you can think of it as a tetragon. And it's a little weird because it's a solid to solid state phase transformation. And we're really comfortable with liquid to gas. We're really comfortable with solid to liquid, right? You melt an ice cube, it's going to turn into water. You heat up water, it's going to turn into steam, right? That for us is very, very comfortable, those types of phase changes, right? Where the atoms are moving around. This is the same idea, it just happens that the two phases are both solid. So you heat something up and it turns into a different solid form. So the atoms shift. So this is when it's in a cube, but they shift like that. So that's cold, hot. Cold, thud, hot, ring. So that's all, it's like an atomic ballet, right? They're just subtly shifting and creating completely different properties. And this is what underlies that shape memory, and this is what underlies that super elasticity. So something, I've always thought this is really beautiful, something this subtle on the atomic scale can cause completely different properties and can let us expand stents inside of people and can let us do all these different things with this material. And so there are all these different things. These, this super elasticity and this shape memory, these are useful in, in an incredible amount of applications. Um, you look at uh, putting things first, putting things inside people's bodies. So looking at the um, carotid artery stents or looking at the, this is that heart patch. So here's the one side of the heart patch, here's the other side of the heart patch. Um, biomedical things, putting stents, you know, squishing stents down basically on a guide wire and installing them inside someone's body. Um, bone claws, couplings in F14s. Um, same idea, it's a shape memory effect. You have this pipe going inside this pipe and then you heat it up forms a really tight coupling, right, for the hydraulic lines. Um, dental arch wires. So what basically happens is you've got this material and as your teeth straighten, it continues to maintain a constant stress against your teeth. Um, super elastic glasses. I had a pair of these where you, you can bend them, right, and twist them. I don't know if you guys have ever seen them. This is made out of nickel titanium. This is made out of nitinol. Uh, Anti-scald devices. What basically happens is as you heat a material up to a certain, as you heat this nickel titanium up to a certain point, at a certain set point, it changes shape and it turns off the faucet so that you can't scald yourself. Um, morphing aircraft. This is a next gen, um, this is still a ways off, but this is a next gen aircraft. And what we're uh, basically working on is having um, shape memory actuators in the wings that will, instead of having set fixed wings, that will actually morph the wings depending on what you need. Because what you need for takeoff in your wing structure is a lot different than what you need while you're flying, is a lot different than what you need while you're landing. Uh, so to optimize aircraft. So, so there's a lot of applications for this. Now there's one trick. Um, in nitinol, in nickel titanium, when you're doing this phase transformation, strains localize. And what I mean by that is strain is basically a measure of how much deformation you have. So what happens is if you take the simplest test, if you take a bar of this material and you pull it, or a sheet of this material and you pull it, you would expect, if I take a sheet and I pull it, that everything kind of deforms the same, right? And that doesn't happen. What happens instead is that a little region deforms a ton, like 6%, and the other part doesn't really deform at all. So there's regions in this material that stretch a lot, and there's regions that don't stretch at all. And I'm going to explain why that is. And so when you're thinking about how these materials fail or how they um, fatigue under cycling, the fact that their deformation behavior is so weird will affect their performance. And so it's OK, but we need to be able to predict it. So let's go back to super elasticity, because this is the property that I'm going to focus on today. Um, and this is the idea of that heart patch being deployed or the stents being squished. Um, so you can see you can bend stents a lot. And here's a stent that's actually it's got the sheath on it. And when you deploy it in the body, you pull the sheath back, and the stent expands. Now if you look at this graph, this is a graph that we use a lot in mechanical engineering. Um, this is what's called stress. It's a measure of how hard you're pushing something or how hard you're pulling it. It's a measure of the force that you're applying. So think about this y-axis as how much force you're applying to the material. 
this x-axis is how much it's deforming. So right here, if I don't pull at all, I have no deformation. Okay? As I pull harder and harder, I get more and more deformation. Okay? A normal curve would kind of go up like this, and then it would break. Right? You pull harder and harder, and you get more and more deformation, and eventually it breaks. Um, so the nickel titanium curve looks really weird. Okay, so what happens is you start out in this cubic form of the atoms, you pull harder and harder, and right here it goes, I can't take it anymore, I want to break, but I have an option, I can change to a tetragon. And so what it does is from here to here, there's a ton of deformation, and what it's doing is it's changing its shape from a cube to basically, a, you can think of it as a tetragon. And now here it's loading the tetragon. Now when you unload, it comes back down, it's in this tetragon form, that's the form that went thud, right? And now right here it transforms back from a tetragon to a cube, and look at all this deformation that it takes back up. And then it comes back down to a cube. So the reason that it's super elastic, that it can take up all this deformation, remember deformation's on the x-axis, the reason it can take up all this deformation is because of this, right, this transformation. So look at this transformation, you come back, as you're going from this tetragon to this cube, you take up all this deformation. That phase transformation, it's what's letting us have this super elastic property. So there's a ton of ways of viewing this phase transformation that people have done in the past. Um, you can view it by, we're gonna look at this one first, you can view it by looking at the morphology. So if you watch, there it goes, boop. So that's the tetragon phase that's propagating through. Um, you can view it by painting a wire in liquid crystal paint and watching the transformation pass by. So it was started out in a cube, and here's that tetragon phase going through. You can view it by looking at, um, basically the wires have kind of an oxide coating on them, and as you pull a specimen, it starts out in a cube, so the whole thing is cubic, and it has this oxide coating on it. The cubic phase doesn't have a lot of deformation or strain. The tetragon phase has a lot of strain. So as you pull this material, it starts out in a cube, and then the tetragon phase has so much strain to it, it's got so much deformation to it, that it cracks the oxide coating, and it changes the reflectivity. So this is the cubic phase, this is that skewed tetragon phase. This is little tiny deformation, this is a ton of deformation. And it also throws out heat, so you can use infrared cameras and you can look at, here's my cubic phase, and this little patch of hotness is my tetragon phase. This is a problem. If you're trying to deal with how to figure out how to design these materials, the fact that if you pull this bar like this, this phase doesn't have any strain to it, any deformation, all the stretchiness is coming from just this internal little band. So if I were to pull this bar, I wouldn't see anything here, and I'd see this little band in here stretch a ton, right? So it's, it's a weird material. And so we looked at this um, and we thought, okay, well how do we kind of get a handle on quantifying how much this material is stretching and how much transformation is actually taking place? How many cubes are turning into tetragons? Okay. And so what we did is we, we utilized um, a new technique that's come out in mechanics. It's called digital image correlation. So for those of you who know about strain gauges or who know about exosometers, there's different ways in mechanical engineering to measure deformation or strain. Um, it's something that we do all the time. Um, it's very important for us to understand the behavior of materials to know how they deform. And so what we can do is we can um, clip little, basically, exosometers on and we can watch how much they move and we can get a measure of how much they deform. Um, we can do things like that. Um, this basically, takes that to another uh, level. Um, what we do is we track dots. Um, so we paint a specimen with a bunch of dots. And we pull the specimen, and we take a picture at the beginning, and we take a picture here, we take a picture here, and we take a picture here. And then we track all the dots in relation to every other dot. So you can imagine if you took a specimen and you had two dots and you pulled it, you could track the distance between those two dots and get an idea of how much it's deforming, right? So now paint a specimen with hundreds of thousands of dots and track every dot in relation to every other dot. And you can say, ah, right here between these two dots, it deforms this much. Here it deforms this much. Here it deforms this much. You can get a really good idea of how the entire material is deforming. And there's a ton of applications for this. Um, it ranges anywhere from uh, dynamic 
um, impact. So this is, I believe, an impact on a Kevlar. Um, to looking at the deformation of stents, to looking at impact on a car door. Um, so what you're seeing is this is the de deformation of something that's been hit by a projectile from the bottom. And it tells you exactly how much it's deformed. Um, it's used on bridges, it's used on MEMS. Um, so it's used big length scale, small length scale. Um, this is a door, so you can see a door um, from a crash impact test where you're looking at how much it's crumpled. Uh, fighter jets, uh, little um, unmanned air vehicles. So we use this a lot in all, all different applications for, um, for figuring out how things deform. And the experimental set that we use looks like this. So here is our specimen of nickel titanium. And we have to have two cameras to track the dots. So here's one camera and here's the other camera. This big thing right here is actually our heat camera. So we can measure how much heat everything's pushing off. And what we do is we take a specimen and we pull it. And as we pull it, we track the deformation. So the purple is small deformation cubic face, or the austenite, and the atoms are in a cube. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a big band of red come through. That red is the tetragon face, or the martensite, that makes the ring. Sorry, that makes the thud. Okay. So we start out in this cubic austenite phase. All we're doing is taking the specimen and pulling it. If it was a normal material, it should have uniform deformation, but it's not. You're going to see a really weird response, and that's because of this phase transformation. So it's cubic, small strain. We pull, boom. There's the, there's the um, tetragon phase. And that's a huge difference in strain. That's a huge difference. So that anything that's tetragon is stretching a lot. Anything that's cubic isn't stretching at all. And this happens, it, it matters also how fast you pull. So we were looking at cables. Um, cables are used because you can bend them, and also if one wire snaps, the rest will take up the load, so it's safe to use cables. Um, we use them in pacemaker leads and guide wires, um, in civil ap engineering applications, in actuators, um, morphing wings, things like that. So if you watch, I'm going to play these two videos. This one right here is a cable that we're pulling slowly. This one right here is a cable that we're pulling quickly. And what you're going to see is the purple is the small strain cubic phase. The red is the high strain skewed tetragon phase. And they're going to look totally different. So this transformation from cubic to tetragon happens differently depending on how fast you pull. So one, you've got kind of this macroscopic front moving through on the left. And on the right, it's almost like a dripping effect. And in both, you have regions, even when you're quote unquote fully transformed, you've got regions that are still cubic. Okay. So it's a very, very complex deformation because of this transformation. It also matters how you pull. So this is all in uniaxial tension, but uniaxial tension we don't, when you have something in your heart, when you have something in your leg, you're, you're not in uniaxial tension all the time, right? You're bending and you're twisting and you're putting things under structural deformation. So if you take a tube, like a stent, and you bend it, what you're going to see is transformation behavior from this cube to this um, skewed tetragon that depends on the fact that you're bending it. So right now we're still a cubic, and boom, there goes the tetragon phase, sneaking up from the bottom. That red is a much, much higher deformation than the purple. So you would expect, depending on how you bend this material, that it's going to fatigue first at the areas where you've got a lot of deformation because of this transformation. We also worry about um, the types of uh, bending rules that we can apply to things that are normal materials, such as the assumption that when you have a plain section and you bend it, so if you take a cross section and you bend something, that plain section should remain plain. That's a very basic assumption for us. We can't use that here. And it goes back. So, so we know that there are some really funny things happening at the macro scale, that it depends on how fast we pull, it depends on how we pull, we've got this transformation going on. And one of the biggest things is to understand how that weird behavior at the big scale, how that 
is connected to what's going on at a very small scale. So you remember at the very beginning of this talk, I talked about the connections between length scales and how important that was. So one of the things that we need to do is go and look at the length scale of what we call the microstructure. So this, again, is that idea of these grains. So in each, and this is uh, not nickel titanium, uh, but it's a clear picture. So the idea is that in each grain, your atoms are going to be arranged slightly differently. So let's say that all the grains, all the atoms here are all arranged in a cube. In this grain, the atoms might have a cube that looks like this, that's angled at 45 degrees. In the grain next door to it, this one, maybe the atoms are arranged in a cube that's facing straight up. Okay? So that's the idea between, behind grains. And depending on how big these grains are, depending on how they're oriented, depending on all these things, that will drastically change the behavior of the stent that you put inside your body or the coupler that you use on your F14. So we need to look at this length scale. But the problem is light microscopes don't give us enough resolution. And the reason for that is because light has a certain wavelength that's actually pretty big, right? So if you have a really small object, no resolution, right? The wavelength goes right over here. So we need something with a smaller wavelength to be able to look at this. So we use electrons. Electrons have a much smaller wavelength. Um, and so electrons are basically, it's the same idea, except we use electrons for very high resolution to look at very, very small things. And a scanning electron microscope, or an SEM, is a microscope that scans electrons across the surface of a sample to image very small things. And it looks like this. So you can see there's a laptop in the back, which gives you kind of a scale. Okay, and there's a big pump that's underneath here. And, and it works by doing, this, by doing this scanning with electrons. And those electrons interact with the object's atoms, and it gives us an idea of topography, and it also gives us an idea of composition. So the guy who invented this was um, Ernst Roska, and it was actually in 1933, and he won the, the Nobel Prize in Physics, and it took a while, in 1986. Um, and I just think this is really neat because this is the original drawings, and this is one of the first prototypes of the electron microscope. And it is one of the most important inventions of the century. Um, we use it in science all the time. And so I just picked some cool images to show you what, what the scanning electron microscope does. Um, these images of the dragonfly are courtesy of Professor Brennan Griffin um, of the University of Western Australia. And he found a dragonfly <laughs> and put it on in the scanning electron microscope. So you can see here. And you can look at, as you zoom in, and this is still, for a scanning electron microscope, this is still pretty low resolution. Um, you can look at the, uh, the wing, the hoof, the wing closer up. Um, anybody have any idea what this is? Actually, it's, it does look like that. So it's, anyone else? That's a good guess. I did this, actually, it was very close to it. I did this with my husband, and he had a guess, and he guessed something very close. Yeah. <laughs> no, oh, so sorry, let me give you guys, this is something totally different. We're off the dragonfly. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, Something totally different. Um, so this is something totally different. This is a, it's nothing to do with the dragonfly. Um, it's a plant. It's something that we hate. <laughs> we try to get rid of. Close. It shows up on all our lawns in the summer. Dandelion. <laughs> uh, so this is a dandelion. <laughs> all right, so you can see the spores. Uh, Moth, so that's how it gets the, the water. Plant stem with all its vascular bundles. Fly's eye. Pollen. Okay. So, so you can really image incredibly well. Okay. And you can see just these amazingly beautiful things using this technique. So we can use the scanning electron microscope to look at metals. Um, and again, this is this idea, the blue lines are each a grain. So right here, the atoms are aligned like this. You know, here, the atoms are aligned like this, okay? So a grain is where atoms have a certain orientation, and then this blue line is where the different orientations meet up, okay? And so what it looks like under microscopy is this, right? So you can see these different grains. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine this idea of tracking every particle with relation to every other particle 
but do it in an SEM. Okay. To track this transformation between a cube and a tetragon for atoms. And if we do that, we've got a bunch of things that we had to overcome. Um, one of them was we had to get, if you have a field of view that's one-fifth the diameter of your hair, how do you get tracking markers that are small enough? <laughs> right? So what we did in order to get around that, if you look here, um, we had to get, so these are all the little dots that we track in relation to every other dot. And if you, we had to actually um, take nanoparticles and chemically functionalize them in order to get them to stick so we could track them. Okay. Um, so we, we combined these two. We also had to deal with the fact that there's a bunch of distortions that come in from a scanning electron microscope. Um, the scanning electron microscope works by scanning a beam of electrons. So in a perfect world, you spend exactly the same amount of time on each point that you're scanning, and you would have an exactly equal jump to the next row and you'd scan, perfect jump to the next row and you'd scan. Um, in an imperfect world, which is what really happens, is maybe you dwell a long time at one point, and then you go boom, 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 and then you dwell a long time at another point. The next row is really short. You have a big hop the next row. So we had to deal with the fact that the electron microscope has this distortion. We also had to deal with the fact that the lenses that are in an electron microscope um, cause a lot of distortions themselves. And you guys have seen this. If you look through a regular camera lens or something, you can see this kind of parametric distortion, right? Same idea with an electron microscope. Instead of distorting light, we're distorting the electrons. And so we had to correct and deal with that distortion. And so it took us about three years um, <laughs> to do that. And once we were done, um, we started out with the image on the left, which was a lot of distortion. What we basically did was we took a specimen and moved it, if you move it 300 microns to the um, left, I haven't stretched it at all, right? It's the same specimen. So I take a piece of material and move it 300 microns to the left, there shouldn't be any distortion at all. The material hasn't deformed at all. But what you would see is that the top corner is telling you that it's moving a lot to the left and the bottom corner is actually lagging behind, so it's putting in a fake distortion. Once we corrected it, the whole thing says every point on my surface is moving 300 microns to the left. So once we had done this correction, we could go ahead and we could run our test. So we could look at the microstructure, the small scale of this nickel titanium. And so we prepared the specimen. Right here on the bottom, this is the stage that we use. So you can see we put the specimen in right here and we pull. And we took a dog bone shaped specimen. This is a common geometry for us. And we put, we used something called a focused ion beam to deposit little markers right here to tell us where to look. So we had to mark what area we were looking at. And we looked at three different areas. So we looked at an area right here, we looked at an area right here, and we looked at an area right here. And you remember when you pull this dog bone, you expect that band to come and propagate through just like you guys saw, right? So that's exactly what you see, except now we're looking at a very small length scale. So these white lines, these are all grain boundaries. So this is all, we're starting in this cubic form or this austenite form, and this, each grain, maybe the cubes are arranged in this grain like this, and the neighboring grain, maybe they're arranged like this, and they're arranged like this. So as we pull, you can watch very, very high deformation coming through the microstructure. Okay. So you can see it's, it's the same idea, and then this is the macroscopic stress strain curve. So here we go, here's this transformation that's starting from this cubic to this tetragon. It's going through our very small fields of view. Okay. And then it's finally complete and we unload and we have residual strain, or residual deformation. So this is this idea in mechanics of trying to link the very small scale, like here, in this texture, this microstructure. We can, we can um, adjust this microstructure based on how we process the material. And we can adjust this microstructure by processing it different ways to get better behavior of our stent, of our airplane, of whatever we're using this for. Okay. So, so back to our fundamental questions. Um, how do we change this microstructure? Do we make the grains bigger? Do we make them more misoriented with respect to each other? Do we change um, you know, the... the um, amount of gray matters, do we, what, what, do, what do we do on the microstructure so that we can get better heart patches? So we can get more super elasticity, so it can last longer inside of somebody so we don't have to cut them open and take it out. Um, 
how do we tailor this material for specific properties? So how can we tailor it to have more super elasticity? So the goal here is to mess around with the microstructure to get better, better properties, better SMAs. <coughs> and that's where I'm going to end today. I want to thank my graduate students. They, they do all the hard work. Um, and uh, we also pulled a lot of our video demonstrations from um, this uh, nano site, this MRSX site, um, and my funding. And then I'd also just briefly like to run through, um, I pulled a lot of images from different places. Um, so I'd like to run through those. Um, and thank you guys so much for your attention. And Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the MLOS Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.